Uh, it, is, it is a great honor to be introducing our speaker this morning. Uh, James White is the Senior Vice President of Leadership Development for the YMCA of the Raleigh-Durham Triangle area, where he is also a member of the National Training and Leadership Development Advisory Board for the YMCA of the USA. He is also currently serving as Senior Pastor of Christ Our King Community Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. As if that's not enough, uh, he has also served as a chapel speaker for several professional um, and university football teams. He is an author, a speaker, a consultant, uh, and he and his wife Cynthia live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they have three children. And I really mean this. I wish every single one of you could have the opportunity to meet and talk with James. Um, when Evan came in this morning, I shook Evan's hand and I said, Evan, I had breakfast with James and he changed my life. And Evan said, I had dinner with him last night and he changed my life. <laughs> Please give a warm Scots welcome to James White. Uh, good morning. Wow, it is good to be here with you. A couple of things, though, that I must say before we begin. Uh, I was asked this question. I was asked, uh, do I still get nervous when I speak? And I've been traveling and speaking now for the night since the 90s. And, uh, and I said, you know, in answering that question, I didn't have time to go in detail, but I'll let you all know since we're friends now. Uh, one of the things for me is there's a certain kind of nervousness I don't have anymore. And the kind of wondering, do I have acceptance? Because if you saw my Nubian queen of 28 years, now I've got a woman who, she is my queen. Her beautiful brown skin brings the reality of the grace of God in a fresh new way. Because the only way I could have pulled a fine looking woman like her, a little short bald head guy like me, there has to be a God. <laughs> Some of you know those situations where you look at her and you see him and you go, oh, there's got to be a God. No way. <laughs> so I have full confidence in light of my acceptance. And then I do have three wonderful children who are now adults, 21, 22, and 25 years old. So I'm in an interesting space, but I'm still nervous. And I'm nervous because now there's a different kind of nervousness, and there should be whenever you are communicating truths of Scripture. And especially when you're communicating in some of the times that we live in. One of the things for me that this is my first time on this beautiful mountaintop of Lookout Mountain. And there's a beauty that is majestic that can almost cause you to forget about some of the realities of the world. I can only imagine that. And yet we can't forget about those realities. When we see the image, again, of what is a city that is a city whose narrative is a narrative of romance, a narrative of love. But now there's an image of, mil of military presence and there's an image that has forever, forever changed the way we will probably see Paris. Very similar in the same narrative that we have with 9-11. Some of those same emotions and feelings are there where terrorism is not confined to that one place. But to have over 127 people die and 99 critically wounded in a fear now that penetrates that reality. That even though we're here in this secluded place, I am glad because of technology and the world that we live in, we cannot remain secluded. Then when you think as well, while at the same time, and unfortunately, some have placed these two moments in the same space, but at the same time, when I knew that I was coming to speak here, I thought it was interesting and ironic in light of the story of our national narrative of what happened when a group of young men who sometimes we casually call leaders but who perform for us week after week but who understand some of the economic realities of a university system and therefore at Mizzou 
in order to speak into some of the issues of social justice, they decided to do the unthinkable. And they decided that in our world that sometimes economic strategies bring change much more than philosophical discussions. And so these football players decided that no, we will not play when athletes put their scholarships on the line. And coaches as well understand that. And so now as a result of that one act, now there's a buzz across the nation as well. As a result of an act of saying, no, we will risk a million dollars being paid per game. And it makes you wonder because others now are chiming in and others are now staging protests and realities. And, and so these are interesting times for us to live in. Historic times, and that seems like overused rhetoric all too often. But I wonder for us here, if we understand that these are moments, that they're difficult moments. And I wonder if we understand that, yes, I'm sure right now it might be hard for you to listen because the voices of procrastination are probably peering in very loudly because we are in November. Why didn't I study? And you're saying, please, James, no offense, but I'm out of here when the time is up. Because right now, even though this is a Christian college, many of our faculty are not agents of grace when it comes to the academic realities that we have. This morning, I want to take us to a text, a familiar text, a familiar story that really does deal with this whole idea of how can we learn some lessons in the difficult moments that can often determine our destiny? Mark's gospel is an appropriate place. It's the shortest of all gospel accounts. He's writing to people who are being persecuted, and therefore they don't need all the longevity and the details possibly that Luke the physician might give. And so Mark goes to this moment that we find in several of the other gospel accounts, a familiar moment, but in Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful. In other translations, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death, even to the point of death, but I need you to do something. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it was possible that the hour might pass from him. And he says, we see and we peer into his private prayer, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Simon, I know you want to. The spirit, the will is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and he prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time. He said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Isn't it not enough that the hour is coming, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners? Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. This text brings reality that often we don't have. It is always strange to me and somewhat ironic that the Christ of Scripture seems to be much more human than we are. It's always interesting to me that the Bible is written in such a way that you see more truthful moments from Scripture than sometimes you even hear from our lives. And now we have a chance to see Jesus in a moment that few heroes would ever want recorded. We see Jesus in a moment that is a difficult moment. Even in the very beginning, it's interesting. And again, the Scripture is written in such a way that sometimes words have power and words have meaning. But the first thing you see here, which is strange, is Jesus in a place of pain. And this place of pain is a place named Gethsemane. 
This is that difficult moment, but even the name of the place is ironic. It means olive press. And could it be that he's intentionally in Gethsemane because the symbolism has meaning because we know that this is that moment, that moment where he's going to be betrayed. And even though Jesus is in the olive press, the place where olives are crushed and there's oil, and olive oil was a symbolic of healing, could it be that in this place of pain, Jesus knows that he's going to be crushed? Could it be there's some intentionality in this place? Because this question is going to mean healing for all of the nations. But in this place of pain, Jesus is willing to do something that we talk about. He's willing to be vulnerable. Do you hear what he says in verse 34? He said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? This is is painful. Have you ever been there when he says, my soul? John Ortberg and Dallas Willard give a little bit of clarity to this, to what can sometimes be mysterious. It's not just the internal part of our life, but it could be very much the combination of our body, our minds, and our will, our spirit. All of that together in cases it makes up our soul. And Jesus says, it's so bad, it's to the point of death. Have you ever been there? To where all you can say, I'm just crushed. And notice what he asked for. Matthew 26 says this, he says, remain here, keep watch with me. I love this. Jesus is so different sometimes than who we are because in his painful moment, this moment that many would want to avoid, he says, would you just come with me? I'm always strange by the way we've had our American version of Christianity and sometimes we call Christianity a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You ever notice how nothing about really a relationship in the gospel is personal? Because as a matter of fact, you don't even know how spiritual you are until you engage with other people. Jesus says, Jesus says, keep watch with me. That's why it's always interesting people don't need anyone. Because if the Savior, again, if God, who is fully God and fully man, if he needed someone to come with him, don't we need people to come with us? And what he's saying right here is, is that he has a soul. He's dealing with something that, that is not just physical. It is, isn't it interesting that there's more pain in this moment many times than before he goes, you see, at Calvary. He's saying, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. There's something about internal pain that's even more powerful than physical pain. There's something about the internal world that is more difficult. Jesus invites other people to his place of pain. Notice what he says. Keep watching me. Who does he take? He takes Peter, James, and John. That is disturbing for me. Because you know who he takes with him? The guy who's going to deny him three times. He takes with him two hotheads, James and John. Not exactly the right people to take with you, you would think. Not only that, but then the Bible says, you notice here in the text, he comes and he finds them sleeping. Now, this is always curious to me, because if I need you at my worst moment, I'm at least expecting you to stay awake. They are snoozing. And you know what's so incredible about this story? He goes one time, he comes back a second time, and then three times. Isn't it interesting that we serve a Savior who draws us near even though we're unfaithful and fall asleep? In our place of difficulty, in our difficult moments, I wonder if we invite other people. There are no perfect people. They're mostly unlikely people. Jesus invites people with him in this moment, but he walks through this moment. But as he invites them with him, he tells them to stay there, and he goes and he prays. And now, again, thirdly, he does something, he prays. And that sounds overly simplistic, but when you listen closely to the kinds of prayers that Jesus prays, it is quite amazing. It says here, notice what he says in verse 35 and 36. It says, he went a little beyond them, and he fell to the ground. We're talking about honest 
prayer. This is not a Presbyterian prayer. This is not a deacon prayer. This is not a Baptist prayer. This is honest praying. When is the last time you had such honesty in the presence of God that he fell to the ground? This is not posturing himself because of who can be heard. This is honest praying in this difficult moment. But what he says is incredible. Look at how honest he says. He says he went a little beyond them and he said, if it is possible, this hour might pass by. Then he gives clarity in verse 36, and he was saying, Daddy, Abba Father, intimate prayers. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. How does he pray? He prays very personal. Daddy, Man, this challenges me because all too often in the difficult moments, and I wonder if we're in a time period yet where we're willing to call him daddy. But not only that, notice what he prays. He prays very clearly. He prays understanding who God is. He prays with the confidence. All things are possible. I know who you are. See, no matter what our circumstances might be, may we always know that is one of the things that should always be strange about this institution than any other institution, is that we talk to the God where we know all things are possible. Even though there's sociological and economic confusion, even though there's global fear, we must always understand we pray to the God, all things are possible. But I love the honesty in Jesus' prayer. Uh, can we do this another way? Have you ever been that honest? God, I know what you want from me, but can we do this another way? You should pray. Hey, God, can you just miraculously cancel the finals? God, can, could you have placed me in another situation? When do you pray honestly? Father, why do I have to deal with the complexity of what's going on in my own? God, is there another way to do this? But I notice how Jesus prays. He says, all things are possible. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what do you want? He prays in a way that says, it's not about me. It is about you. And why does he pray this prayer? Here's why, because he's getting ready. He says, let this cup pass from me. He's getting ready to drink from a cup. That's going to be full of the wrath of God. And one of the things we've got to be careful of when we're looking at this text, because some often teach that we compare our Gethsemane to Jesus' Gethsemane. Well, there really is only one Gethsemane, and that's the Gethsemane he went through. Anything that you and I have gone through is really something that we sometimes have orchestrated. Because Jesus is getting ready to suffer for something he didn't do. And guys, to be honest with you for a moment, most of what I suffer for is because of stuff that I've done. And what I want him to remove from me is bad choices often that I've made. But Jesus is praying, can you let this pass from me? Why is he praying that? Because every lie that's ever been told, he's about, again, to bear it in his body. Every act of sexual molestation, he's about to drink from that cup. Every racist institutional reality, he's about to drink that. Every situation of hypocrisy, he's about to take this. Every illegitimate reality of sin that is expressed in the world, every terrorist act, he's about to do this. Every person from Al-Qaeda, every person, again, from ISIS, every brutal decapitation, he's about to drink this. He's about, God, is it possible? Can we do this another way? He's about to bear what he did not do because of what we have done. That is incredible. Maybe what we can do in being like Jesus is are we willing to say, God, is it possible we can do this another way? Because maybe there are leaders in this audience who are willing to go through some difficult moments for what you didn't do. Maybe there's some leaders in this audience who are willing to say, I'm willing to take the journey of Jesus and willing to do some things and bear some things and come here in an institution like this institution to be prepared for a leader to deal with injustice that I had nothing to do with. Maybe we're going to be like him in that moment. 
But he provides perspectives for his disciples. Says he came and found them sleeping. That would have sent me over the edge. You ever been there to where the time when you need people the most, they're not there for you? Isn't that crushing? When you would think that these, look, you're taking with you Peter, James, and John, and you would have think, okay, if I woke you up the first time, then you're going to be awake. And you would have think, rub your eyes, do something. I mean, you see that Jesus is troubled. I mean, they're watching, and he's falling on his face. And then we know that the other accounts of this, it, it's bad. He's sweating drops of blood. So then that means if he's sweating dead and he comes back to them, they can see the blood on his clothes. They know this is a serious moment, and yet he falls asleep. The grace in this story always amazes me because if you fall asleep on me one time, see you wouldn't want to be you. Look, I, I'm going to get some other friends. Jesus comes back three times and he says to Peter, the one who's willing to die with him. Remember Peter said earlier, even though all may leave you, I got your back, Jesus. And Peter is willing to be courageous but he's not willing to be faithful. Sometimes I wonder if we have courageous talk, but not faithful talk. Peter says, I'm willing to die with you, but he can't stay awake with you. Have you ever noticed how sometimes you can be dramatic for the Savior, but you can't be simple with him? Have you ever noticed you're willing to change the world, but you can't even change your own circumstances and surroundings by being faithful in prayer? But finally, God does provide power. There's hope. Mark chapter 14, verse 40 and 42, it says, He came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And they didn't know what to answer him. And he came a third time and he said, Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed in the hand of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Where is the power? Where, where did the power come from? See, even though his disciples are not faithful, he doesn't quit. Oh, I love that in the text. Because you know what that means to me? Even when we're not faithful, God's not going to quit. Even when we blow it as his people, he doesn't quit. He stays with his plan. He stays with the hope. He stays with what he has to do. There is power. Where did the power come from? you got to remember that it may seem like he's alone, but he's never alone because he calls him Abba Father. There was another place in the text where I saw some things as well, and, and, and it's interesting here, but, but he stays with them knowing that all of them are going to leave him, and he still comes back to them. But there in Luke's gospel, there was something strange that appeared to me. In Luke chapter 22, verse 43, it says, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. In Luke 22, verse 43, that verse always said to me that, you know, sometimes I feel like, you ever feel like God is always just running late? I want to go, angel, why didn't you come so that he didn't have to go in the garden? I could have used some, he could have used some strength long before the garden happened. But that's when you begin to realize that when you look at the word angel in the original language, in the original language it means anglos, it means messenger. What is it the angel did to strengthen him? It was simply a word from God. That was what strengthened Jesus. It was a message from God. I don't know what the message was, but here's good news for you and for me. Because I've wondered why doesn't God often send an angel rather than my having to go through the difficult moments. And God says, I've sent something a whole lot better. I've sent a completed word from me. Now that sounds trite. That sounds okay, the Bible. No, can I just tell you something? In the difficult moments that we face, we've got something even better because not only do we have the Word of God, but as we go through the difficult moments of our testing and of our time, we've got the Spirit of God indwelling us. And I thought, even as I look at this story, Jesus is still up to allowing us to have something that even he didn't have. The very presence of God at work in us. See, it's when we walk through these difficult moments that we experience, I believe, these designed moments that God intended for us. 
So what's the application of all of this? Can I just suggest that you're smart enough to figure it out? Can I just suggest, I don't want to insult you with simple, because I believe this morning there's some application for you as Christ followers. It's very clear and very simple. Application that will answer the words of Hoosier when they say things like, take me to church, I'll worship like a dog at the shrine of your lives. I'll tell you my sins so you can sharpen your knife. Offer me my deathless death. Good God, let me give you my life. When those kinds of lyrics are insulting, it's because someone didn't bring clarity that God is there in the difficult moments. In the difficult moments, it defines who we are and who we're going to be. We have to go more than what Kendrick Lamar says. We're going to be all right. See, I believe we got to be like the voice. And I believe this institution, and I want to say this very personally to you, but this institution has an opportunity to be like the voice. To not run away from the difficult moments. Because you know in the voice, you know the time when we cheer in the voice. How many of you watch the voice? Like, don't act like that. I, you know. If you don't watch it, the time when we always clap, it's when they hit those crazy high notes. I wish I could sing, but it's the time when they hit that crazy high note. You just go, whoa. I mean, it just, Adele, Adele latest album, oh my goodness. When she hits those notes, I mean, even if you don't like the music, it's, it's something about that high point, that crescendo that captures your attention. There's something about that that brings everything together. Covenant College, I realized that this morning, this idea of difficult moments and looking at our Savior in Gethsemane, I think it's appropriate for you because you're positioned for difficult moments. Your legacy suggests that. Because your legacy goes to a place for me as a little boy. When I thought about the fact of that I'm going to look out mountain, something just kept resonating in my mind. I'm going to speak at a college on Lookout Mountain with believers. And that's because in 1963, there's a speech that people made famous. And in 1963, and that was a speech that I studied that really began to reframe who I am and what I do. And in that speech, there was a crescendo moment in 1963 as Martin Luther King gave his speech. And I remember memorizing parts of that speech as a little boy. I remember studying that part of speech as a little boy. It is a rhetorical moment that, again, has shaped American history. And let me read to you the part that was the crescendo, that if you go back and look at the video, it was the crescendo of when the crowd begins to yell. King said these words, could it be in 1963, these words, he said this, and this will be the day, towards the end of his speech, this will be the day when all God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, and ironically enough, he moves to a point that the audience probably did not expect because all of those mountains are majestic. But let freedom ring from Stone Mountain, Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every molehill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. 
Our Savior went through difficult moments that defined destiny. It was our destiny. Because we know because he said, nevertheless, not, don't let this cup pass from me. Thank God. He says, not my will, but that will be done. And he goes to the cross because he's bearing our sins. And again, that moment defined destiny in an incredible way when you think about the gospel. But I would suggest historically, people are still looking for freedom to ring from Lookout Mountain. And you are that legacy. Whether we realize it or not, just as majestic and mysteriously enough, you're here at this university because maybe you're the generation to go through the difficult moment that will define our destiny in a whole new way. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain in Tennessee. We know that freedom will not ring because of a flag, but it will ring because of a cross. We know that. You know that. So may you understand as you go to class today, there's a world beneath the mountain that maybe is counting on you. Could it be that you're an answer to Martin Luther King's prayers and to the prayers of a nation? Could it be that in this room will be the change agents who will walk through the difficult moments that will change our destiny? So I say to you today, let freedom ring because you know that only we can be free in Jesus Christ. And he who the Son is set free will be free indeed. Let freedom ring. Father, we thank you that in your difficult moment we see honesty and vulnerability. God, I pray right now that in this space, on this campus, that there's a legacy of the gospel. And that gospel will meet the answer and respond to what was said in 1963. Let freedom ring. May we, maybe for some of us, we need to be honest today. If it's possible, would you let this pass for me? But nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. I pray as we leave this place, we walk in the spirit of thy will be done. In your will is understanding that it is only through Christ that he is our hope. He is our place. He is our person. He is our freedom. Thank you, God. Thank you that he said, thy will be done. And we say that today. And it's in the name of Jesus, in his name, may we walk out of here with courage and confidence and constructing a new reality.